Well, let's turn to our scripture text. Today it comes from uh, the book of Philippians, Philippians 3, 12 to 21. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them or you can check out the screen. This is uh, Philippians 3, verses 12 to 21. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Let us therefore, as many are perfect, have this attitude, and if anything you have a different attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I, I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has given even to subject all things to himself. Morning, Waterdam. It's good to be with all of you. I want to say thank you to all of you for your cards and letters and support of us as pastors. Uh, some of you sent us some cards here this month. Um, we also want to say thank you to the board and to all of you for sending us over. The pastoral team got to go over to uh, a community over in Ohio, Oakwood community um, in Ohio near Cuyahoga Falls, and uh, spend some time together. Um, the one thing that was interesting about it was that uh, we met uh, several pastors and wives, and as you gather there, it's always fun to get to know some of the guys. And uh, one guy was from Ohio. He said he went to the hospital, and he was walking in to visit with somebody. And when the person, uh, when he went there, the person, uh, there was a person sitting in his car, and, it, and he said, can you help me get out? Um, I, I need the wheelchair that I have out here on the side. Can you wheel it over to me? And he said, sure, I'll help you. And he goes, what else would a pastor say? Uh, when somebody's asking that. So he said, uh, one more time, one more thing before you go. He says, can you help me get my legs out of the car so I can get into the wheelchair? And he goes, sure. And he reached down, he grabbed the man's legs and started to turn around with them and they pulled right off of the man. <laughs> and he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And the guy says, ah, that happens all the time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> And then, and then I met, met another pastor from New York, and uh, he was telling us he, he and his wife went to Sam's Club because they were a little bit late getting to our lunch, and uh, he was saying that they had to go buy Star Phone because in New York, you're not allowed to buy Star Phone, and you're not allowed to sell it. So they had to go buy Star Phone in Ohio, like paper plates and stuff like that, or Star Phone plates and cups, to take back to New York with them. Can you imagine? I thought I'd seen everything, yeah. It's like... But we learned more than that. We had a great time. We had an a awesome opportunity to hear uh, Carlton Harris from our Reach Noble ESCA global, uh, Reach Global uh, uh, section of our, of, our, of our national office. He's the executive vice president of Reach Noble. He and his wife, Carol, came and shared some encouraging words to all of us as pastors and wives and some of the pressures and stresses that we all face. In the ministry. So we're thankful for you sending us over there to hear a good word like that. I want to uh, open up our time with prayer, but I'd like for you to, to follow me along with, uh, after we do that, to say the Lord's Prayer, and we will use debts and debtors as we do it. But before I go there, um, I want you to pray for uh, Rich Harbaugh's family. Anne's brother, John Nolan, passed away into his eternal home to be with the Lord uh, this week. And we're just thankful because Anne specifically went over there before she had passed away to witness to him, and he received the Lord while she was over there. So that was such a big prayer and such a big uh, deal for her. So we're thankful for that. 
And uh, we also want to pray for uh, and congratulate Ethan Colbertson. He, I think he's done with his uh, boot camp in the Marine uh, boot camp, and he is graduating, I think, this weekend. I'm not sure if it's this weekend or next. Is it this weekend? So they're all over there. So let's pray for the Colbertsons and thank God for Ethan making it through. So let's pray. Father God, uh, you say in your word, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And so we thank you, Lord, for having that comfort of knowing that you were there for us in that moment when everything doesn't matter anymore down here, but everything matters up there. So we thank you, Lord, for that. We ask, Lord, that as we set our minds on heaven today, and we thank you, Lord, for all the great things that you do for us in Christ, that you would bless us with the sense of having eternity in our hearts, that we have a place to go. We are citizens of heaven and that we have a high calling that in this world we'll need to press on and push forward to the goal of our faith because we have treasure in heaven, an inheritance that we're never perish, spoil, or fade. So I just pray, Lord, for your comfort for those that have lost loved ones. I pray, Lord, that the, the home of heaven, the hope of heaven in Jesus Christ would be strong in their hearts. And if their souls are sad, that they would ask you to restore the joy of your salvation, to create in us a new heart and restore the joy of your salvation in us, for us. And as you taught us to pray, Lord, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, today we continue our series on the afterlife. When we think about setting our minds on heaven, here we will discover why Paul tells us to set our minds on heaven above instead of the earth below. Um, because, friend, if you're heaven born, you're heaven bound, right? Uh, that's why I want to talk to you about your citizenship. Your citizenship is in heaven. That's what he says. And it's a great reminder because the Bible constantly reminds us and has to remind us that you're not permanently down here. You're not home yet. And that there is a longing, a homesickness for our home, isn't there? You just look at what happened uh, the other day. We understand that we're not home yet when we see what we see on our newscasts. You don't need a degree to know what happened to Israel was evil. And yet there's some who try to defend it, try to defend the murder, the rape, the brutality in the public square. Isaiah 5.20 gives us this woe. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Well, what does he mean? Well, the commentator wrote this. I thought it was interesting. He says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That endeavor is to confound both the names and the natures of virtue and vice of piety and impiety. Commend and applaud what is evil and disparage and discountenance what is good. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. Ignorance and error for knowledge and truth, in other words, who subvert or pervert all the great principles of truth, wisdom, and of righteousness. That's exactly what's going on when you see that being touted in the streets to actually video somebody's murder on Facebook and send it to their family. And then call it okay and not call it evil. It's evil, plain and simple. And we should say something. Adrian Rogers says this, It is better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. It is better to speak the truth that hurts than heals, than falsehood that comforts and then kills. We need a word from above, I would say. We need hope from heaven. We need a word from heaven on the earth below. 
How do I set my mind on heaven when we live down here? Adrian Rogers has another great quote. Yes, there's a heaven in the sweet by and by, but there is to be a victory in the nasty now and now. In the nasty now and now. And Paul tells us what we need to do. We got to press on. It's like, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, we're going to learn. I want to learn from Paul. Uh, Tony Evans talks about this. He says, how to have a life down here that will matter up there because the perspective up there transforms the life and my life your life and my life down here. So that view, that perspective of heaven transforms our perspective down here. God's word constantly reminds us that we're not here forever. We're only here for a short time. The psalmist said that in Psalm 90. I think it says, uh, teach us, O Lord, to, to number our days. Give me a heart of wisdom, David says. So we need God's help to do this. And so God's word constantly reminds us of this passage here. And Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. He has transferred us. And he's reminding us that if you're a born again believer and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been transferred. We have been relocated. We are on a temporary assignment here on earth. Our purpose is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to share the gospel with as many people as we can possibly and enjoy God forever. The good news of the gospel, friend, is that if we're heaven-born, we are heaven-bound. I want to encourage you, if you're a Christian today, in Paul's language, you are a citizen of heaven. That's the first thing. You are a citizen of heaven. What does that mean? You're not stuck here on earth. You're not stuck here on earth. The people of Philippi were living in Philippi were citizens of Rome. Their names were kept on record in Rome. Their language, their lifestyles, their laws, their dress, their protections they enjoyed were reflective of Rome. Just as the citizens of Rome in Philippi were reflected Rome, we as citizens of heaven, our language, our lifestyles, our way of life, the laws that we follow are to be citizens of heaven's laws, language, and lifestyle. We're to look like heaven's people. What is heaven? Heaven is where God dwells. That seems kind of simplistic, but it is. It's where God dwells. It's his place. It's his home. It's his dwelling. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on high and a holy place, he said. God has a place where he lives, a real place, a dwelling place. Isaiah 63, verse 15, look down from heaven and see from the holy and glorious habitation. That tells us where the place is. It's in heaven. He says in chapter 57, God has a place. And in chapter 63, God says, I look down from your place. He calls that place heaven. That's the heaven of heavens where God dwells. In Psalm 33, 14, it says that God looks from heaven. Verse 13, from his dwelling place, he looks out. So this is a place where God dwells. That's where heaven is. That's what heaven is. It's a place called heaven. In Isaiah 66, 1, he says, heaven is my throne. Heaven is a place, not just a state of mind. Jesus ascended, Acts 1, 9, he ascended up into heaven. Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place. If it were not so, I would not have told you, but I go away to prepare a place. And if, it's tr- if I go away to prepare a place, I will come back. I will take you to be with me in that place. Acts 1.11, it says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Then Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven, which means he's going to return 
as he came, as he left. He's going to descend back down. And both feet are going to hit the Mount of Olives. And it's going to split apart. A similar conclusion can be made in the story of Stephen's death. This is Wayne Grudem. Just before he was stoned, he was full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's Acts chapter 7, verse 55. He did not see symbols or a, some kind of state, a symbolic state of existence. He saw heaven. He saw a place called heaven, a place that really exists in our space and time and in our universe. You and I are citizens of heaven. A citizen is a person who legally belongs to a country and has the rights and enjoys the protection of that country. I like that. I like it. Citizens adopt the culture and practices of the nation of the kingdom which they belong. We are to look like, we are to talk like, we're to smell like the people of heaven. I don't know what kind of cologne they wear out there, but that's what we're supposed to be smelling like. We are to be heavenly minded. Heaven is a place. It's not just a state of mind. We are also called to be heavenly minded. Paul says that we are to be heavenly minded in, in that passage in Colossians 3 verse 2. He says, set your mind on things that are above. He's talking about heaven, not on things of the earth. We're to be heavenly minded. We're to be heavenly motivated. And that's what we're going to see here in this passage. Paul says, not that I've already attain, obtained perfection. He goes, I haven't arrived yet. This is the most spiritual person probably walking the earth at the time. Um, and, and yet he says, I'm not, I'm not there yet. That gives hope to me. How do you live down here when you're from up there and you still got to live down here, right? It's like, you know, believe it or not, when you come to Pittsburgh, people want you to convert right away to Pittsburgh Steelers, right? Now, some people hold on and they hold out for their team, you know. I'm not mentioning any names, but there's people in my household that still root for Cleveland. My wife was talking to a lady up the nursing home, and she said that she, her eyes were kind of like, she was just sitting there listening to her and not really saying anything. And she said her name, and she goes, you know, I'm from Cleveland, and I root for the Cleveland Browns still. And the lady started laughing. She couldn't get a word out of her. She started laughing. She goes, oh, no. You know, started laughing. You and I are supposed to be heavenly minded and heavenly motivated by what God is telling us. As a Christian, we work and wait down here. We belong up there. Our time on earth is temporal. It's short, but our time in heaven is eternal up there. We are given heavenly resurrected bodies. They're going to be transformed. Look what it says there in verse 21. Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Jesus could eat. He cooked breakfast. He ate with the disciples. He passed through walls. He had a glorified body. We're going to have a body that doesn't ache anymore. I'm not going to have that pain in my knee anymore. I'm not going to have to worry about what I eat anymore. I'm so sick of that. I want to have a donut and some french fries. I do anyway, but it, you know, not as much as I used to. Right? We're going to be transformed. That's great encouragement. And so God's word tells us that we're citizens of heaven. So what is Paul telling us about this? He says, you're a citizen of heaven. You need to live for what's going to last and not live for the short-term gain. Live for what's going to last. As we think about what that means and we think about our own life, as we live down here, how can I expense experience the victory that Adrian Rogers talked about in the nasty now and now. Yes, there is a heavenly home that we long for us. And, and we are, our citizenship is there. How do we live what's going to last in the nasty now and now? Paul admits, he says, I don't know. He says, I have not arrived yet. Look at verse 12 there. Not that I've already obtained this 
or I'm already perfect. I'm not perfect. How often do you talk to people and they say, well, you know, if you ask them if they're going to heaven, they'll say, I don't know, I'm not, very, I'm not perfect, Pastor Jack. I'm not perfect, I'm, you know. Friend, none of us are, but Jesus is. And that's who we're relying on to get us there. His righteousness is not a righteousness of my own. So Paul is saying there, not that I've already obtained it, this or already imperfect, but what does he do? He says, I press on, I push forward. That means there's a struggle, there's a fight to be fought. Our salvation is a gift from God, but our discipleship, our sanctification, while we live down here, we have to fight for up there. We have to press on. There's a resistance. We face an enemy. There's, Jesus said, in this world, you have trouble. So we have to push on. Forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind. That's our past, our yesterday. Look at verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. And so if I'm ever going to get to my tomorrow, I have to let yesterday go, right? Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I have to look in the windshield. Now, if I look at my windshield right now, I just had another birthday. There's more behind me than is in front of me if I'm bound to the earth. If I'm thinking about heaven, ha, huh, I got all day. I'm looking in the windshield, and I'll glimpse at the rearview mirror, right? So I have to keep heaven in front of me. All of us have a past. Yesterday consists of three things. I got this from Tony Evans, and I'll just shorten it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. There's good things that I have in my past, there's bad things, and there's downright ugly things in my past. How come I can forget them? Well, I can forget them because they're in Jesus. My record is clean. I have been washed in the blood of Christ. Forgetting what lies behind, that's the past, that's the yesterday, looking to what's ahead. Some of us are crippled by our past. So we always identify ourselves as our past. But you're a new person in Christ. The old is past, the new has come. Forgetting what is in the past, straining towards what's in the future. And so we, we pursue what's in front of us. Yesterday does not have to define my tomorrow. Paul had to forget his past. He persecuted the church. He killed people. He focused on putting people away. He was freed from the bondage of sin, sadness, and death. Why? Because he's a citizen of heaven. You are no longer a slave to the earth. I press on. I look forward. I forget what lies behind me, my yesterdays, and I strain forward for to my tomorrows. My tomorrows are secured in Christ. If I start worrying about my past and I start worrying about my sins, I definitely get convicted by that at times. But I remind the evil one that I have been forgiven of my past and that my future is secure in Jesus. How often do we forget that? And so, like, like, like that passage that I read to you earlier... You know, I've been struggling and since I lost my, my, my mom. You know, I'm by myself now. I'm the, I'm, I'm the next one, right? My sister and I were the next ones. You know what I've been praying to help me? I've been praying Psalm 51 where David says, Create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. Restore the joy of your salvation. That's what I've been praying for my own soul. So I hope it's helpful to you. I'm trying not, I'm not trying to forget my mom, but, but I, I don't want to be defined and crippled by my past of what's happened. I want to strain towards what's the future because the future is good if I believe what the gospel believes and what the gospel says is there's a heaven to look forward to. There's a heavenly home. Matthew 8, 11 says that you will recline with, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
eat at a table with them. He didn't say Isaac was Abraham and Abraham was Isaac or Jacob was... He said Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, grandfather, father, and son, will be eating at the table together and people will come from all over in Matthew 8, 11, and it will, they will want to recline with them. I, my prayer is that someday I'll get to eat with them, Jesus, and my parents, and my grandkids. We had a big meal the other day. I want everybody at the table. It's a bummer when nobody shows up or somebody shows is missing, right? So Paul has something for us here. I press on. I'm not going to rest on my laurels. I look back, and yet I don't let it hinder my... I, I look forward. We need to press on. Some of us have letters and all kinds of things after our name, years of learning, several degrees, impressive resumes, maybe even a, a great reputation, good things to be proud of. But if you're a Christian friend, you have something better to look forward to. You're a citizen of heaven, so you have a high calling, a divine purpose, if you will. We are to, again, press on and press forward. As we press on and press forward, what does that mean as we look at this passage here today? I have a divine purpose. Look at verse 14. Towards what? Towards the goal for the prize for the upward or high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Friend, notice it's a high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You're a citizen of a high calling of, of God in Christ Jesus. So as a citizen of heaven, you're under God's rule and reign. That means I'm pressing on in his way. So it, 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 eternity defines what I do in the temporal, my priorities. Your view of eternity impacts the way and the pattern and your prioritization of your life in your time down here on earth, which means, in plain language, it impacts who I marry. It impacts who I date. It impacts my, the way I am at work, my work life. God rules and reigns over everything. It impacts my gender. God rules and reigns over that too, whether you want to believe it or not. God rules and reigns over my sex life. God rules and reigns over anything in my life because he is God. I am prioritizing my life around his agenda, not mine. I am not self-centered. I am God-centered. So it makes a difference. It's supposed to be pressed on, in, and all around us from eternity's book, which is heaven. Your citizenship is in heaven. Your view of eternity impacts the way that you prioritize your time in the temporal. I press on, Paul says, towards the goal for the prize for the upward high calling of God. Eternity focuses me on the principles, patterns that we are supposed to follow. But look what it says there in verse 15. Let those who are mature think this way. So mature Christians, let us think this way. But, he says, if anything you think otherwise, if anyone or any of you think otherwise, what does he say? God will reveal this also to you. In other words, God will have to deal with you. If you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm just, God will have to deal with you. And so verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join me in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many whom I've often told you and now tell you that even with tears walk as enemies with of the cross of Christ. So, you know, like the people that you hang around with. We, we didn't let our kids stay overnight with other people's kids. We wanted them under our, our principles and our priorities. It impacted the way we lived. We didn't let them go to other people's houses because we didn't know what that home was like. You can't tell me that you're a godly person and you're caring about your marriage if you're talking to your girlfriend who's getting ready to get a divorce and wants you to get a divorce from your marriage, right? How often do you hear people talking and, and their girlfriend all of a sudden or their, their friend is saying, you know, I'm thinking about getting a divorce. I think you should too. I've had people do that. I've had people say that. Misery loves company, friend. Don't hang out in that person's life unless you know what you're doing. You have to be careful 
there's some people out there that are enemies of the cross. Notice what he says about them. Verse 19, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. That means their affections fleshly. You said your husband's, you, you, you complain about your husband a little bit with this person, and they'll start saying, yeah, you ever thought about getting a divorce? That, it's dangerous. Their affections, in other words, they're driven by their flesh. Their glory in their sh- they glory in their shame. In other words, they keep bringing it up. They won't let it go. Their mind, it says, is set on earthly things. You see, Paul is saying that people are still of this world. They are in the world and they are of the world. We're supposed to be in the world but not of the world. Christian, you are not of this world. You are to be in the world but not of the world. You are a citizen of heaven. You have a high calling. When we think about who gets into heaven and we look at this, what what does God's word say? Those people who are born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born from above. Those who have redeemed and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The old saying is true. Born once, die twice. If you're born twice, you'll die once. We need to trust that God's future in heaven is is good for us. So heaven is a place where the word of God rules and gives us a foretaste of of the glory divine. Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on heaven. You are no longer a slave to earth. You have a high calling. You have treasure in heaven. What is that treasure? Well, I love this passage, but I don't think I'm going to have time to get through all of it if I explain every one of them. But when we think of this, what does God tell us that's in heaven? Our Father is in heaven, right? You got that. Our Father who art in heaven. Our Savior is in heaven. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has entered now into the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. For Christ has entered not into the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but in heaven itself. So Christ is in heaven. Hebrews 12, verse 23, our brothers and sisters in the faith will be in heaven. We will recognize there's a continuance aspect to what we see and feel. Jesus was recognized by the disciples as Jesus. Jesus recognized the disciples. When they were standing up on the mountain in transfiguration of the mountain, Jesus was standing there, Moses was standing there, and Elijah was standing there. They knew who they were. They could recognize them. I already told you about Matthew 8, verse 11. We will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our names are in heaven. If you look those passages up, it says in Luke 10, verse 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Romans, or Revelation 21, 27, we have the title deed of some property there. Those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's your name, brother, sister. Your name is written there. You have property there. You have an inheritance there that will never spoil, perish, or fade. That's 1 Peter 1, 3. An inheritance, something that will be given to you when you come. into heaven. You have treasure in heaven. If I believe that my mom and dad are in heaven, I certainly have treasure there. You know, like things that used to matter so much down here matter so little. What really matters is all of it's up there. And it's secured in Christ. We have a treasure in heaven. Jesus says, don't work for what's down here that moth and rust will destroy. 
Put your treasure in heaven. You are a citizen of heaven. You have a high calling. Press on, press forward. Forgetting what was in the past. Straining towards what is in the future. Because you have a treasure in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, as we think about this place and all the people who love God being there, and that we can go there by simply trusting in Jesus Christ, that heaven is a place where we can genuinely love you. We're either already going there to live forever in complete perfection and glory. And now we have to live in the light of heaven. And moment by moment, we leave this life as a Christian. We're going to go to that place, that place called heaven in the sweet by and by. So, Lord, help us to live in the nasty now and now. Paul said it was better to depart and be with Christ. Help us, Lord, as we try to live down here looking forward to up there. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear the words of the benediction. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.